Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Editor's Note. And today we have yet another very interesting guest, namely Professor Russell Berman, uh, who is a director uh, of the working group for the Middle East and uh, Islamic world at the Hoover Institute, and also uh, a formerly a senior advisor at the policy planning staff at the State Department in the U.S. It's uh, very good to have you here. Thank you for having me. You're currently part of a, a delegation visiting Israel uh, as part of, uh, uh, or TV7 is hosting this delegation. And I'd like to ask to your perspective uh, as to uh, your experience. You've already traveled southward. Uh, we still have a very long uh, itinerary in front of us. Nonetheless, uh, it was quite the shocking part mm -hmm. of this trip rather than the strategic discussions that are, of course, uh, ensuing uh, during this week. Well, Jonathan, thank you for having me. As interesting as the many discussions I've been able to have here have been, it's a difficult trip. Um, I've been to Israel many times before, wonderful country, beautiful country, remarkable country, but um, it's a very, very somber time now after October 7th. Uh, the, yesterday we visited Kfar Aza, one of the um, kibbutzim that was so brutally attacked on October 7th. We saw the destruction, the burnt buildings, the um, devastation of the location uh, that stands in such um, stark contrast to what one could see as the beauty of the environment there. Mm -hmm. We, uh, after that, we saw the film, the film of the atrocities, the film that the killers themselves made, also dash cams from, from cars mm -hmm. and, and other sources. And I have to say, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, humans can do terrible things to humans. Um, of course, this was not the Shoah, huh? but it is the kind of brutality that one sees in ethnic wars, probably saw something like this in the Yugoslav wars or in mm. Uganda genocide, Rwanda genocide, excuse me, um, um, but comparisons are beside the point. Uh, seeing the bloodlust, the hate, the, um, the um, willingness of these young men to kill innocent people, uh, to they see a father run into a shelter with his two sons and throw a hand grenade in after him, um, shooting a dog, uh, um, and then taking the dead bodies back into Gaza and the crowd just... Uh, kicking the bodies, kicking the corpses, uh, and shouting, Allahu Akbar, uh, that sends a message, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose, to at least their perception of what, what God wants. Uh, the um, scene of um, one of these uh, young men um, cutting off the head of a corpse. Uh, I don't, what we saw was evil, we saw was the presence of real evil in the world. Mm. And it is not going to be an easy problem to solve for policymakers as to how do you organize a security system, how do you organize an international system in which it's not really about border dispute here or there, um, it's not really about um, uh, tax structure here or there, it's about facing evil mm. and an evil that wants to destroy you. I can understand that the Israeli public opinion can only insist on defeating this enemy completely. You're a professor at Stanford, and I, I would like to get your perspective about the situation in campuses in the U.S., in Europe, and, and other locations as well, including Ivy League schools, which have access to first-hand experiences. They do have those funds in order to send them abroad and, and experience uh, matters firsthand. Where's the disconnect with what currently is seen on campuses and the reality that you saw on that video? Where did they misinterpret it in relation to reality in those campuses? After October 7th, and even before the Israeli response began, 
we saw an upswing of uh, expressions of anti-Semitism uh, on U.S. campuses, but not only anti-Semitism, but endorsement of the violence of uh, the um, the killers in uh, the kibbutzim. Um, uh, there was one Cornell professor who was quoted as saying that he felt exhilaration. Um, uh, other professors at Columbia and elsewhere made similar statements. Uh, the slogans of the students um, included, um, by any means necessary, that is to say, they believe that there is a legitimate political goal. I'm not quite sure what that is, but they believe this is a legitimate political goal. And to achieve that goal, any means are appropriate. That is to say, the end justifies the means. That is to say, there are no ethical constraints on what one might do in order to achieve a goal. This is appalling. In institutions, the, their role above educating the individuals is also relaying the ethics and the legal structures of what humanity created? Uh, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, uh, some might believe that higher education um, could convey, should convey, must convey uh, ethical values in addition to technical knowledge. Um, I believe that uh, most faculty would disagree with that. Mm. Most faculty believe that they should convey expertise in their field and um, refrain from uh, conveying, I'll call it wisdom, about, about life or the distinction between good and bad. At the same time, however, many of the same faculty are quite comfortable with um, uh, promoting their political ideological views uh, in, um, uh, inside the classroom and outside the classroom. So there's a bit of a tension between that. Um, there's a mobilization of students and some faculty around a very simplistic, oppressor, oppressed ideology. In some parts of humanity are de designated oppressors, the others are the oppressed, and the oppressed are therefore able to do whatever they want by any means necessary, including rape, burning, decapitation, in order to achieve what these deluded individuals imagine to be emancipation. This is terrible. I think and not only I, but... Uh, that many, is no less evil than those acting. Yeah. We, we need to have a fundamental change in the character of what goes on in, in universities mm. to, to disallow this um, solidarity with evil. And this would require different kinds of leadership. It would require um, university uh, presidents, provosts, deans to, um, frankly, be more directive uh, in uh, what goes on inside the university. We're not going to abolish tenure. That's not going to happen. We're not going to abolish academic freedom. Also not going to happen, happen. And neither of those things should happen. But the president, the provost, the deans can have a significant influence in terms of who gets hired, who, get, who is kept, and what gets taught. And so far... Well, at this point, many of those university administrators are really just looking out for their careers uh, and want to avoid conflict. Uh, but in a world of evil, choosing to avoid conflict is really capitulation mm. to evil. Well, let's turn to another point derived out of this. And that is, to what degree do these campuses... And, and the various anti-Semitism arising out of those impact foreign policy? Immediately, not a lot. Uh, in the long run, they might. Um, because the 20-year-old the who is uh, declaring his or her solidarity with the terrorists um, might, uh, in 20 years, work in government. One hopes that maybe the 20-year-old at 25 will be a little wiser and 30 and 35 and people grow up. There is something about uh, youthful foolishness that is, is going on. Uh, nonetheless, one has to worry about the um, transformation of political consensus as, uh, as these groups uh, uh, make their way through the, through the institutions. The foreign policy world, 
is itself uh, not unanimous in the United States. Of course, there's a lot of support for Israel. It's a question about how deep that support is, how far that support goes. Uh, we do face a certain amount of um, isolationism on the far left and on the far right. Uh, I think they're both misguided, and I don't want to have to choose one over the other because they're both wrong. Uh, but one has to continue to engage in the foreign policy world and push back against the um, those who would accommodate evil. Mm. Let's turn to the U.S. alliance and policy vis-a-vis -vis Europe and Israel in this triangle. What, what comes to mind when you identify the various complexities, issues that you've been working on at the uh, foreign policy staff? Yeah, uh, a few points. Um, I think from the from an American point, well, from an Israeli point of view, the issue is security for the state of Israel um, in a tough neighborhood. For, from an American point of view, Israel's an ally and we want Israel to be secure, but the United States is engaged in a global struggle with Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Uh, they impact Israel, but the U.S. engagement in that struggle is obviously a different one than for the small state of Israel. Mm. Uh, Europe is an important piece in this jigsaw puzzle. Uh, Europe uh, has been asleep for too long. Uh, but the Ukraine war may have woken it up to the need for it to contribute more to its own defense, to its own security. Um, it's still not doing enough, but it it's doing more than it has in the past. Uh, President Trump pushed very hard on Europe to contribute more to toward to our defense, to meet its Wales pledge uh, in in NATO, and to wean itself from. Um, dependency on Russian energy. Uh, the European elite sneered at him. Uh, then the Ukraine war happened, and it turns out that he was right on all these points. Which these, many European leaders do acknowledge today. Well, yeah, better late than never, right? but Trump was right and Biden was wrong right. uh, uh, on Nord Stream, on um, NATO spending, um, and frankly, uh, on that list should be the whole question of where U.S. troops are. We don't need U.S. troops in 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 Germany to protect the Oktoberfest. We need troops on the eastern flank to uh, prevent a Russian a Russian invasion. If if um, Ukraine should lose, if Ukraine should lose, the Baltics are not are not safe. No. Uh, and uh, I don't think and and while. The United States may come to an, um, the support of uh, NATO allies in such a situation. I'm not fully convinced that the rest of the Europeans will. Not, uh, not, the, not the French, not the Spanish. Uh, frankly, not, I worry about the Germans too. It also, of course, depends in all of these countries on what the composition of the government is. And there's an extraordinary amount of internal political stability in those European countries, in part as a function of um, immigration from the Middle East. Indeed. When you're looking at the current situation vis-a-vis -vis Iran, particularly, uh, considering the fact that what Ukraine is for Russia, Iraq is for Iran, and the Iranians have time and again highlighted their aspirations to oust the United States, which is ultimately its major stumbling block to regain full control over what used to be the Persian Empire uh, in the boundaries of those two countries. What do you identify there? Is there something that should be done in order to somehow push back? And is the Biden administration currently doing enough? The Biden administration is doing nothing on this. That, that's a whole other very sad story. Uh, we will see now if the Biden administration will respond to the um, to the attacks in in Jordan uh, um, just a few days ago. Um, this is the test: you know, does does he have metal or not? Uh, he may lose the election on the character of his response to that. But the bigger picture is: yes, uh, Iran wants to push the United States out of the Middle East, just like Russia wants to push the United States out of Europe. This is the long, long-standing Russian dream. 
And just like China wants to push the United States out of the Western Pacific, uh, that's the that's the American perspective, which is uh, consistent with, but of course much larger than the Israeli perspective on what's going on right now. Um, the um, uh, we need to have a foreign policy posture that projects strength and a willingness to push back against aggression. We haven't had that for several years. The, the, the way the Biden administration left Afghanistan and effectively his endorsement for the humiliation uh, that, that took place sent a signal that the United States could be pushed around and Russia and Iran and China are all acting on that, acting frankly rationally. If they believe that the United States is a pushover, a paper tiger, as Mao used to say, then they're going to try to try to push forward. I think we're in a very, very dangerous time now between, between this January and next January when we might have a different president and our enemies are going to want to take advantage of this window of opportunity. Let's talk about BRICS, if we may, uh, considering the fact that we see that uh, Russia, China, India, uh, Brazil, and South Africa are looking to expand to additional countries. And ironically, South Africa has been bolstering its uh, attempts to dissuade other countries uh, from not necessarily engaging with Western alliances, but to seek more of a southern atmosphere, uh, southern world, if I may call that, uh, rebellion against the northern world or the Western world in that sense. Are there concerns about this evolving in a factor that may indeed challenge Western civilization to the degree that could not only contest, but also really hamper on efforts to, to grow and improve in, in sectors of civic society? Of course. Uh, the United States and the West should pay more attention to the, to the BRICS, to the, I don't like the term, the global south. Um, uh, I try to avoid that term, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, this doesn't mean conceding. This doesn't mean uh, uh, signing up uh, for, for their ideology. What it is really is a recycled third worldism of 50 years ago. Now, uh, important would be to develop foreign policy uh, focus and um, intentionality in um, engaging with the different countries there who have, in fact, different interests. Uh, they're, they're the Russia, is, China is are trying to corral them into a around a common denominator, but that common denominator doesn't really map onto their distinct national interests. And you know, one lesson of the current era is that for all the talk of globalism, for all the talk of universalism, uh, nations have their national interests and they will pursue them. And if the United States can make it clear to India that it is better served through an alliance with the United States, then as part of the BRICS club, India is going to, to see the light. Uh, India may, some in India, may, probably members of the old Congress party want to see it as part of, uh, part of the global south, but India has an adversarial relationship with China, and uh, therefore India is a natural ally for the United States. India, I believe, is frankly a natural member of an expanded security architecture that would come up uh, through, the, through the Gulf uh, and include Saudi Arabia and Israel eventually. I think that kind of uh, regional structure that involves uh, Israel and the Sunni states is objectively right and it was almost achieved, then it was interrupted, but it is going to happen eventually. Mm. That's, that's the goal. A precondition for that security structure where India and the Sunni states, the Sunni Gulf states are aligned is Israel's demonstration of its strength in defeating Hamas. Very interesting indeed. Uh, let's take it one step forward though, since we're seeing uh, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar speak time and again about uh, the, the challenges between Europe and India. And 
while not particularly articulating that vis-a-vis the United States, it seems like India is demanding respect, something Mm -hmm. that obviously uh, may be well-placed in certain areas. And therefore, to what degree or how would you translate that into practical matters? All countries deserve respect or all countries that behave in a respectful manner deserve respect. Mm -hmm. Uh, some countries believe, behave reprehensibly. Um, but uh, India is a, is a great country, heir to a great civilization that has uh, lots to share objectively with the West and with the United States in particular. Uh, we, need to, um, we need to build on that. I believe the diplomacy of uh, the United States has in the past paid insufficient attention to uh, countries of Africa and, and to India. Um, uh, President Trump actually had interest in developing a robust Latin America foreign policy, unlike his predecessors. Uh, so, yes, the world is global, uh, but it's global in the sense of made up of a network of nation, nations with national interests engaged in bilateral relations. Basing everything on the Westphalia treaties of 1648 or? Basically, yeah, sovereign states. You know, states, right. uh, it, uh, having a sovereign state is important. Indeed. We don't have very much time left, but uh, nonetheless, I'd like to touch on strategic power competition and how do other allies and partners of the United States uh, fall within that category since a month into uh, the uh, transition when the Biden administration assumed office. It uh, held a meeting in in Alaska at the time with Wang Yi, the state counselor of China. Uh, Antony Blinken was there, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor. And within that discussion, China highlighted to uh, their American counterparts, we are pure nations and let the games begin, so-called. How do you see the U.S., operate within that sphere and reassure its allies and partners that do have transactional relations with China, so does the United States, operate within the limitations and constraints that do not allow the so-called strategic power competition to alter the equation in China's favor. Well, you know, of course, that there's this discussion about the difference between decoupling and de-risking. In the gray space between there, Uh, between those two poles, uh, there's an opportunity to limit a nation's vulnerability to uh, the malign efforts on the part of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, China is an enormous country. It's an enormous economy. Uh, We can't, it's, one can't wish it away. Uh, It's going to, it's going to remain there. It's going to remain a... I don't think anybody wants to wish it away, for that matter. uh, But one has to be um, clear-headed Mm-hmm. about what kind of supply chain dependency one wants to have on China. One has to be clear-headed about what kind of um, uh, intellectual property uh, expectations one can have there. Uh, nothing in this debate, nothing in this discussion is anti-Chinese. Uh, all problems with China would be solved if China had a multi-party system and an independent judiciary. Um, the, uh, the recent uh, finding of the Hong Kong court against the Chinese real estate firm uh, is a, it will be an interesting case to see whether the Hong Kong court's ruling will, uh, will, will hold in mainland China. Uh, mainland China claims Hong Kong as part of it. Now we'll see, it does, it, does that work in two directions? So uh, the, the United States and the West are going to have to uh, engage in um, economic statecraft with China to develop strategies that um, make us safe so we can't, are not subject to blackmail because we're dependent on uh, certain product or certain raw materials that, uh, that China controls. We have to think about the whole electric vehicle, electric car uh, discussion in that context. The shift to uh, green energy, to the, the green transition may have an environmentalist logic to it, but it can't mean subordination to 
Chinese um, monopolization of certain raw materials? In the long term, yes. In the short term, I'm not so sure. According to a number of scientists that I've uh, had deliberations with who are official government scientists, uh, their recommendations are not usually accepted, uh, at least not in Europe, uh, due to political considerations uh, of coalitions and other things that the United States doesn't have necessarily to contend with. Uh, yes, agreed. That's One can have a debate about the, uh, the, the environmentalist claim altogether. But my point is that just as Europe should not have made itself dependent on Russian energy, Completely the United agree. States should not make itself dependent on Chinese rare earths. Agreed. Uh, same goes for China, uh, for Russia, excuse me, and same goes for Qatar, for that matter, uh, when we're talking about LNG. But uh, in broad terms, uh, we don't have very much time. I think one of the main issues, and this is a distinction that I make, is that the Chinese Central uh, or Communist uh, Party in uh, China views China as its property, and therefore its interests supersede those of China. And its constitution in China highlights that any governmental organization or private organization is subject to the party, and therefore uh, it utilizes means that are not accepted or even frowned upon in Western civilization. And there is a clear disconnect between West and, and East, uh, North and South as well. But We'll have to leave that for another opportunity. I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Russell Berman. My pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I'd like to thank all of you at uh, home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. home to the cradle of civilization, retains a reputation from time immemorial as one of the most complex, conflict-ridden regions of the world. A cluster of nations, religions, powers and influences, Mideast intricacies pose conundrums to even the most astute individuals. Bombarded daily, indeed every minute, by a barrage of information, some accurate, yet most of it less so, TV7 Israel invites you to watch and hear some of the most knowledgeable experts, most of who partook in creating policies shaping this region today. Join us for Jerusalem Studio every Tuesdays and Fridays for content that truly matters. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.